Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Boulder Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship on this, our first Christmas Eve service in our new sanctuary. What a beautiful evening it is. Wow. And it's also our first candles and carols service since 2018 because we were displaced and unable to have the, the evening services before. It is very beautiful to be together, especially in these precarious times. As I know, many of us are preparing to hunker down again for another COVID surge that's making its way here. So we spent a lot of time this week wondering about whether we could meet here tonight, and we decided that given the data in Boulder County, we could still go ahead with our multi-platform plans. And hello, Zoomies, welcome to you as well. The next two services, December 6th, uh, 26th and January 2nd, were already planned for Zoom only, so we're good there. And then we'll figure out what we do after that. All of our service leaders will be keeping their masks on tonight. And so if you can't hear very well, please use the I can't hear sign, or if you're on Zoom, type something in the chat for Deborah. And if you are here in the building, keep your masks on at all times and keep your distance from others. And also another little announcement for people in the building, do not connect to the Zoom meeting because it kind of messes up the rest of the AV. So I am Lydia Ferrante Roseberry. I'm the minister of this congregation. This is my, uh, I think, 15th Christmas here with y'all. And um, I'm joined this evening by Morgan Sherwood and by our intern minister, Lisa Moore, and by incredible musicians. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so very, very much. And tonight's tech team is Karen Griglack, Deborah Mensch, and Larry Sherwood. So thank you to you as well. As I say our welcome words today, this evening, these are words we say every single Sunday. I invite those of you on Zoom to move into gallery mode to see everybody who is joining you in the Zoomiverse. And uh, those of you here, just take a look around. It's a rare, it's a rare, beautiful moment that we can be together in this space. You are all welcome here tonight. In all the beauty of languages, cultures, and skin tones, and shapes, and sizes that come together in your uniqueness, you are welcome here. In all the ways you experience and express gender, you are welcome here. In the beauty that is who you love and how you love, you are welcome here. In all the ways you make your living and all the places you are from, you are welcome here. Christian, pagan, humanist, Jew, Buddhist, mystic, Muslim, Unitarian, Universalist, with all of the traditions that inform your spiritual life, you are welcome here. No matter how long you are away, nor how soon until you return, you are welcome here. And whether you come with laughter in your heart today or with tears, you are welcome here. You're invited to join us with an open mind, a loving heart, and willing hands. We welcome you all this evening. Our congregation is committed to being a center for spiritual exploration and justice making. And we acknowledge that Boulder, Count, Boulder Valley in the front range of Colorado is the territory of the Arapaho people. And that many tribes roamed these lands before they were stolen from them by white settlers. We have many opportunities for connections all week long um, for spiritual growth and service for, uh, for and with others. See our website if at bvuuf.org or the welcome table in the foyer if you're interested in more information. And in the chat, you're getting some links you can also click on. If you're new here, we're really glad you found us and hope that in, even in this community, this multi-platform community, 
you can experience the warmth and the love of this congregation. And we invite you back any Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And finally, we love to know who is among us. So if you're visiting on Zoom, you can feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. And if you're visiting in person uh, you, and would like to tell us your name and where you live, just stand or wave your hand and I'll call on you. Anybody want to introduce themselves this evening? Well, it, it is good to be here and to be together. I'm going to invite Lisa to light our chalice for us this evening. For those of you in the Zoomiverse, if you have a chalice at home, I invite you to light it with us. And if you want, you can light in the you can write in the chat chalice lit and the name of the town where you're at. And please join with me as I light our fellowship chalice. We light this chalice for the warmth of love, the light of truth, and the energy of action. And now I'll ring the bell one more time to invite us into a short meditation and draw us together deeper into this beloved community. Christmas comes every time we see God and other persons, the human and the holy meet in Bethlehem or in Times Square, for Christmas comes like a golden storm on its way to Jerusalem. Determinedly, inevitably, even now it comes in the face of hatred and warring. No atrocity too horrible to stop it no Herod strong enough, no hurt deep enough, no curse shocking enough, no disaster shattering enough. For someone on earth will see the star, someone will hear the angel voices, someone will run to Bethlehem, someone will know peace and goodwill, the Christ will be born. It is our tradition on Christmas Eve to read the biblical narratives that shaped the Christian nativity story. Now, no doubt you've heard them before, but tonight I'm gonna ask you to listen to them as if you were hearing it for the very first time. We're reading from the New International Reader's Edition, so you can get a better sense of the storyline. It takes out a lot of the these and thous and a lot of the old language. What I want you to do is listen to the hardship. Listen to the dreariness and the drama in the lives of those ordinary people who, like us, had grown weary of the darkness that they were suffering from in their times. And then also listen for the juxtaposition of fear and joy that bursts forth in this story time and again. The first reading comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month after Elizabeth had become pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth in a town, a town in Galilee. He was sent to a virgin. The girl was engaged to a man named Joseph. He came from the family line of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel greeted her and said, the Lord has blessed you in a special way. He is with you. 
Mary was very upset because of his words. She wondered what kind of greeting this could be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. God is very pleased with you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son. You must call him Jesus. How can this happen? Mary asked the angel. I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come to you. The power of the Most High God will cover you, so the Holy One that is born will be called the Son of God. I will serve the Lord, Mary answered. May it happen to me just as you said it would. Then the angel left her. Now from Matthew chapter 1, 18 to 25, Joseph story. This is how the birth of Jesus of, Nazar uh, of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary and Joseph had promised to get married. But before they started to live together, it became clear that she was going to have a baby. She became pregnant by the powers of the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph was faithful to the law and he did not want to put her to shame in public. So he planned to divorce her quietly. But as Joseph was thinking about this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And the angel said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. The baby inside of her is from the Holy Spirit. She's going to have a son, and you must give him the name Jesus. That's because he will save his people from their sins. Joseph woke up and he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him to do. He took Mary home as his wife. Fast forward nine months, and sometimes those nine months seem to go pretty fast. Uh, Luke chapter two, Jesus is born. In those days, Caesar Augustus made a law it required that a list be made of everyone in the whole Roman world. Everyone was required to go to their own town to be listed. So Joseph went also. He went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea. That is where Bethlehem, the town of David, was. Joseph went there because he belonged to the family line of David. He went there with Mary to be listed. While Joseph and Mary were there, the time came for the child to be born. She gave birth to her first baby. She wrapped him in large strips of cloth. Then she placed him in a manger. And that's because there was no guest rooms where they could stay. There were shepherds. shepherds in the fields nearby. It was night and they were taking care of their sheep. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news. It will bring great joy for all of the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Here is how you will know I am telling you the truth. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a large group of angels from heaven also appeared, and they were praising God. And then the angels left and went into heaven, and the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem, let's see this thing that has happened so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby. The baby was lying in the manger, and after the shepherds had seen him, they told everyone. They reported what the angel had said about this child. All who heard were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary kept all these things as a secret treasure in her heart. Matthew chapter two. Jesus was born in Bethlehem while Herod was king of Judea. 
After Jesus' birth, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the child who has been born to be king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose. Now we have come to worship him. And I'm missing words. Thank you. When King Herod heard about it, he was very upset. Everyone in Jerusalem was troubled too. So Herod called together all the chief priests of the people. He also called the teachers of the law. He asked them where the Messiah was going to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. This is what the prophet has written. Ben Herod secretly called the wise men. He found out from them exactly when the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem. He said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report it to me. I, then I can go and worship him too. After the wise men had listened to the king, they went on their way. The star they had seen when it rose ahead of them, they followed. It finally stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. The wise men went to the house. There they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures. They, had, they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But God warned them in a dream not to go back to Herod. So they returned to their country on a different road. I hear the nativity story differently every single year. The year my daughter was born, it was all about Mary. Now some other years, when I've been yearning for something new, it's been all about following the star. But this year, this year what I'm hearing is a story about a variety of people all over that ancient world. From a young, naive couple to shepherds and kings whose ordinary, very challenged lives were interrupted by something out of the ordinary, by dreams, by angels. But more importantly than that, they chose to notice. And they chose to find courage in the midst of fear and to move out towards that which would bring more light and more joy into their lives. Now before we go any further, let's remember that these stories were written at least a generation after Jesus died. So each of the gospel writers, we, we actually heard from three different gospel writers, it was 30 to 60 years after Jesus died that they wrote these birth narratives. They were not intended to be history in the way that we understand it now, but they were meant to be believed. To the first century ear, the word belief meant to hold dear. Not our post-enlightenment concept of belief as to be persuaded of truth, of fact. So when these stories were written, they were written for people to hold dear what they could glean from those stories that would then impact their own lives. So the nativity story creators, the myth makers, they created stories of angels, dreams, and miracles that pointed towards something, some other deeper truths that they wanted people to hold dear. They lived in fearful times then where untimely death was common and, despo and despotic ruler leaders ruled. We find ourselves also in particularly challenged times with a raging pandemic, 
a frail democracy, women's rights at stake, and so many of our own personal challenges. So when I hear this story written 2,000 years ago, I remember that challenging times have always existed and that actually they probably always will and that still, despite it all, joy breaks through. Joy that, could, that would, may not go noticed were it not for the challenges in which they were placed. Ross Gay, who's the author of The Book of Delights, believes that joy has nothing to do with ease. What he calls adult joy is a joy that is constituted as much by our suffering as by our delight. He goes as far as to say is that joy is possible because we all know we are going to die. We all know we are going to suffer. Life is precious and full of struggle and joy breaks through. Last week I shared with the congregation that my brother-in-law Steve, at 55 years old, had a debilitating stroke that left him weak on his right side and unable to speak. It was a shock to all of us for sure and he continues to progress but slowly. Each up, update this week has been more hopeful than the last, but as you know, a stroke is a long, slow process. But just a couple days after his stroke, his wife, Leonora, posted that Steve had giggled at his son, Ethan. You should have seen the comments underneath in that caring bridge what gratitude and joy I felt to read that. And then I thought about all the other times that Steve must have giggled at his 18-year-old son or his other two children. But that moment was incredibly profound because joy broke through the struggle and the heartache with a giggle. Joy and struggle are interrelated they need each other to be noticed and for us to experience the profound, precious gift that life is. In a Christmas message, my colleague Elia Kemmler put it this way. The old stories we tell at this time of year tell us something important about the nature of joy. The joy can break through like starlight or candlelight in the darkness but that it is surrounded by the hard stuff of everyday life. Maybe that makes it all the more precious. The stories remind us that there is and always will be joy in this world, and it is for everyone. But it usually comes right alongside the struggle. Mary and Joseph make a long, tired journey to Bethlehem before the joy of the baby's birth. The Maccabees live in the hills fighting desperate battles and impossible odds before winning back their city and the oil in the temple lamp burns for eight days. Winter solstice arrives in the midst of the deepest darkness. The joy comes alongside the waiting. It comes alongside the pain and the fear and the uncertainty and has nothing to do with ideal circumstances. Maybe all we can do is issue joy an open invitation and then start paying attention to how and where it shows up. We may discover that joy is already happening smaller and quieter and braver than we realized. And I'd add, like a giggle, we may find joy that is in the taste of an orange, the smell of coffee, the view of the night sky, the sound of a violin. This is a difficult season in a difficult year. Let you find joy however and wherever you are. Blessed be.
Each week, we remind ourselves of the abundance of our lives through our offering. Many Sundays, we give half of our plate away to those organizations with whom we share common values. But during this time of year, we give the entire plate to the minister's discretionary fund. This fund was established by our board of trustees to address urgent financial needs amongst our congregation's members and friends. All people go through times of difficult crisis and high need in their lives. Every year, Reverend Lydia discreetly channels the congregation's love and care through this fund to the community members in need. Sometimes finances are the stressor. Sometimes it is simply difficult to give oneself the gift of self-care, especially when the future is uncertain. In recent times, this fund has been used to pay for mortgages, outpatient recovery services, lymphatic massage for those in chemotherapy, and expensive cosmetic therapies for gender confirmation. Individuals are encouraged to contact Reverend Lydia when they become aware of a need, whether it is for a friend or themselves. And it can be difficult to reach out for help, especially during the hardest of times. So please, I encourage you, be generous as the plate passes. This practice of generosity is, the one, is one of the very concrete ways that we as a community care for one another and in turn are cared for. Let us pause for a moment of prayerful reflection. Spirit of love and of life, great mystery that surrounds us. We are together tonight on this dark, dark evening and on this holy, holy night. In this room and across the miles, We are here in gratitude and hope, each of us having survived untold challenges. We are here, rooted, not in a naive hope, but in one that is grounded in this life, one that recognizes challenge and knows that through challenge, together we survive. We gather on this night knowing that tonight people will be looking for a place to rest their head. And just like the holy couple, they will be told that there is no room again and again. As we gather in the warmth of community, let us send our prayers and love out to those who have no one this evening, who are alone, who are on the streets or who are battling their own inner demons. We are gathering in a time of worldwide turmoil, of pandemic, of political unrest, and of the erosion of human rights. Let us be the light in the darkness that continues to fight for love and justice truly for all. This world needs that message of liberation, that message of hope and of joy. We are here tonight gathered to be beacons of light, to surpass that which we see as our own limitations and to be able to bring a sense of new life into the broken world. 
Let this be our promise and let this be our prayer every single day when we gather and when we are out in the world. Blessed be, amen. Now we're coming to the time that is our own moment of wonder, a ritual we have not done together as a community since 2018. We'll be gathering by candlelight to wish one another the peace and joy that this holiday invites us into. So in a moment, Lisa and I will come around with these candles, and we're gonna come around the outside aisles And each of you should, if you don't have a candle, raise your hand and perhaps the greeters can give anybody who doesn't have a candle a candle. It looks like everybody's all set here. But there's a little instruction here. This is how we want you to do it. We'll come around with a candle and you need to put your candle into the other, the unlit flame into the flame, not the other way around. Okay? And then, so then, so we'll light the first one. Hold on, don't do that. Stop. Light it again. So I have to show them something else. I know, snuffing part is fun. And then the next person will take it like that and light their candle, okay? So we'll come around the sides and then you are gonna light in towards the middle. While we are listening to um, Silent Night, as usual, And then, but here's the other thing this year that's different. It's really hard to blow a candle out with a mask on, and we don't want everybody blowing all over the place. So we have snuffers tonight. So after we are all done with joy to the world, please just stay where you are and wait till your candle is snuffed out, okay? You can snuff now, okay. There we go. Tonight, in this community, we have shared stories, sung carols, opened our hearts to the beauty of music. Tonight, we have turned to one another, lighting each other's candles in the dark. Tonight, we have dared to hear a message of hope, spoken once again against the challenge of the world. It is time now to depart, to go forward to our lives and to the world. May joy be your companion, whether you are with others or alone. May love be your strength, and may the gift of community dwell in your heart. For here, in this place, you will always be welcome. Whenever you choose, whenever you need. And so for now, we will extinguish the chalice, but not the warmth of love, the light of truth, or the energy of action. For these we carry in our hearts until we meet again. And as one flame lights another, nor grows the less, we pledge ourselves to be the bearers of the light wherever we are. Amen and blessed be. We want to thank all of you for coming and joining us on Zoom tonight. 
and for enjoying our candles and carol service. If you would like to stick around for a virtual coffee hour, I would love for you to stick around. If not, we hope that you have a really wonderful Christmas Eve and a Merry Christmas to all of you. I'm going to set up a couple of breakout rooms in case you'd like to chat with one another. Give me just a minute to do that. <laughs> 